Hello and welcome to Curate TV. We have landed here on episode two. Last week we talked a little bit about uh, to go and take away as it relates to the back of the house side of things. Now with restaurants and more importantly bars beginning to open up this week, we wanted to chat a little bit about how this pandemic is affecting the bar side of the industry. We of course can't do that without bringing in our in-house bar and beverage specialist Tori Gotsis. Tori, thanks for joining us today. Hi everyone. As Adam mentioned, we wanted to focus on the impact of current events and the bars. So what better way to do so than to bring in some industry experts and friends of ours to weigh in on what they are actually seeing and experiencing out there. So joining us today, we have Kelly Hoxie, a managing partner for Four Star Restaurant Group here in Chicago, as well as Tobin Ellis, um, the bar guru and owner of company Bar Magic um, out of Las Vegas. So if you both could give us a quick work background and then we'll get started. My name is Kelly Hoxie. I've been with the Four Star Restaurant Group for, boy, in July, it'll be eight years. So I was uh, started as director of operations and then vice president of operations and now I'm managing partner um, with them and Remington's Restaurant which is right uh, downtown Chicago, right across from the Bean. Thanks for having me. Uh, so 31 years in the industry. I started as a dishwasher and a bar back in college. Actually worked in QSR in high school, but uh, yeah, I started bartending in college, 20 years behind the bar, director of ops, GM, all that kind of stuff. And I've been consulting for 22 years, designing bars for 18. My clients started off with the tiniest little independents in little towns no one's ever heard of. And now I have clients that include globally, Starbucks, Marriott, et cetera. But I still work with a lot of independents. It's the backbone of our industry. 90% of American bars and restaurants are independents. So um, I just work on experience design, trying to help bars and restaurants uh, be more profitable, better offerings, more successful. And anything I can do to help that and help our industry is where my focus is, has been for, for a few decades. All right, perfect. Kelly and Tobin, thank you for joining us. Honestly, can't think of two better industry experts to shed some light on this topic. Tori, we talked about it a little bit last week uh, in the uh, food side of things on the to-go and takeaway uh, operations, and uh, now that has been something that has impacted the bar side of things. Yes, to-go liquor has definitely been a hot trend and something that months ago wasn't even legalized. So different restaurants and bars have taken personalized approaches to this new concept. As the bar notoriously has been the highest profit area for an operation, now owners have to sort of seek new ways to recover that income. But when done the right way, to-go liquor can bring in some major revenue. Yeah, you're battling at grocery stores, uh, liquor stores. You know, now <clears throat> that the mayor and then the governor have relaxed some of the guidelines we're able to sell a lot more so you know where before you take a bottle of wine you get it for fifteen dollars you sell it for 30 35 now if we get a fifteen dollar bottle of wine maybe we're selling it for 20 or 25. okay so you see those profit margins going down for the bar yes at the present time definitely okay and then we've done a lot more with some of the liquor programs where you can do uh, a margarita batch where you can make a margarita batch for four people or six people. We've done Manhattans. We've done some different drinks, Moscow Mules, and those have sold very well for us, very well. And again, you know, the market is different, different stores, different neighborhoods. You know, somebody might sell more margaritas. Somebody might sell more Manhattans, but I think it depends what neighborhood you have and what your little glitch is on how to market the liquor brands. And we've done actually pretty well with doing some of our, um, whether they're Manhattan kits or margarita kits, or even the Moscow meal kits, we've done very well with those. It's an exciting new channel that we're seeing legislation already in, moving that might allow this to be permanent. And my personal belief is that you're gonna see to go alcohol sales in America, is it's gonna fly by legalization of cannabis. And we're gonna see probably legalization uh, and legislation that allows for long-term permanent to-go cocktail kits, beer and wine, um, as we already have seen a little bit nationally. Um, 
and it's it's a it's a brand new channel, so it's exciting. So there's a lot of successes out there, and, and there's also because there's a lot of understandable fear. There's a lot of um, I, there's a narrative going around that I've seen a lot saying that you know to go alcohol isn't isn't going to save anything. It's it, it's just you know it's a slow bleed out. It's just a small little thing. But there's some bars out there that are absolutely crushing it with to go alcohol. I can think of three, for example, in the guidebook that have recovered between 60 and 80% of their pre-COVID revenue, total system revenue, just from selling to-go alcohol. When you go to a to-go channel, everything smooths out because now you're not guessing at your sales volume. You know exactly what your sales volume is because the orders come in, because people order in advance. And what a lot of these bars are doing is they are setting up and they've learned a lot of lessons. And I'm going to share a couple of lessons with you. The rest are in the guidebook. Here's one. Provide to-go cocktails in larger quantities. Get away from single service. People are not, if you think, well, gosh, I'm afraid of having a, an item that has a $40 price point. Don't be. The way everyone is hoarding and panic buying and quantity and volume, not only that, even with that gone, if you have to get in your car or drive, to pick up your alcohol, you're not going to buy one drink. You're definitely going to buy multiple drinks. So don't waste the extra plastic or glass. Don't waste all of the pieces to make it small. Batch it and sell in larger quantities. Two, limit your delivery times. The places that are really making money on this learn. This isn't me talking. This is straight from the operators. They started by having to go curbside cocktails every day of the week. And there was so much labor cost and so much effort and so few cars now, some of the most successful places like Haberdasher in San Francisco, they're doing curbside a couple of days a week at a very specific window, and they have a line of cars. So now their focus, like a QSR drive through is figuring out how to get those times, get those cars in and out as quickly and as safely as possible, maximizing labor cost, revenue, all of it. So there, there's definitely a lot of benefits and advantages to curbside uh, alcohol pickup and delivery. So from what you both are saying, the profit margins for maybe a Jack and Coke or a bottle of wine or beer might not be as high. And Kelly, you mentioned restaurants are now competing with liquor stores and retailers. So really the key to selling to go liquor is creativity. These large batches and cocktail kits are taking off. And Kelly, you said four stars dabbling in them. And Tobin, you said you've been seeing these across the country being sold and people are having great success kind of like creating a guest experience for their customers at their own homes. So it's interesting that the desire for that bar experience has not dissipated on the, uh, on the consumer side of things, even when we talk about the to-go service. Absolutely. I think the biggest takeaway for me there personally is that that craft and that skill of professional uh, bartending is not lost and consumers still crave that. So finding a new vehicle to deliver it to consumers has certainly been fun and the creativity has been extremely unique and uh, a lot of fun to watch. Uh, I'd like to transition it here a little bit in talking about limited seating capacities. Uh, that's been a big challenge. Bars and restaurants, as they reopen, are only allowed to do so with limited seating capacities. Here in Minnesota, they're only allowed to open with patio seating only. Tori, what are your thoughts on limited seating capacities? Well, restaurants and bars in the past have relied heavily on that capita per square footage or the model that more guests equals more revenue. So with the new guidelines, as you mentioned, Adam, owners are using to-go services to make up for some of that limited seating. However, that's not gonna be the solution or may not be the solve all for every establishment. And like you mentioned, the restaurants and bars are beginning to reopen their doors and owners need to focus on these dine-in services and what the new normal looks like for that. Well, there's a, there's a lot to that, and there's some low-hanging fruit, and then there's some real top-level stuff. So the low-hanging fruit, one thing we're seeing is a creativity in the way that they're managing the guest experience now. So, for example, because of all these restrictions and the reduced occupancy, the first thing that I've seen that I think is interesting is that people are looking at ways to expand that revenue per square foot by uh, grabbing additional square footage. We're seeing restaurants that are using their parking lots and for drive-in pop-up drive-in movie theaters, so they're providing a different experience for their guests who are in a car to have a meal and a drink. 
we're seeing sidewalk and even legislation restaurant owners are working with legislators to reopen normally uh, streets that are closing streets that are normally open for car traffic are now basically outdoor dining rooms. I mean, welcome to the alfresco age, right? So <laughs> if before spending days and nights and weeks stressing out about your looking at your PL or your pro forma, or your labor card or all these things and how hard it is to survive in while you're constantly looking just at your, the way you used to operate business, take a step back and realize that whenever you're trying to solve a problem, the first thing to do is to enlarge the problem area. Always. This is a basic one-on-one engineer's point of view. You don't just go like this and go, how do I solve this problem? Pull off the blinders as hard as it is to do. Take a breath, look around and go, what's the real problem? Is the real problem that you can only occupy 25 to 50% of your interior dining room? Is that the problem? Or is the problem that the way you used to do business does not work financially now? If you realize that that's the problem, that opens up a whole new brain, an area in your brain to solve the problem. And I know that sounds like it's a little out there, but this is what I do as a consultant all the time. This is probably the only thing I do. I walk into a system and I go, I see everyone with their heads down over one little thing. And I kind of back up and go, what about that? What about over there? What about that? And they go, oh my God, you're a genius. And I'm like, no, I just have perspective. It's really hard to have perspective, perspective when your business is on the line and your second mortgage on your bar or restaurant or whatever else is on the line. I get it, but it's really important right now. And the people that are pivoting and succeeding are the ones that are doing that. They're not limiting their thinking to the old way we ran a restaurant. So that's number one. Um, other stuff that really gets a little bit more top level, these models that, you've, that everyone's used, these models are broken. It's time to look at them and think about what, what are we trying to accomplish as an industry? If you have a business model, and this is my, just my personal point of view, this isn't coming from all the, the, the operators and the guide, but if you have a business model that relies on packing people into a space and jamming mediocre or mass produced supply chain products in their face, and that's the only way you ever made money, that model's dead for now. It's time to think about why are you in this business? Are you in it to provide truly great products and a really incredible experience that's driven by great hospitality? Because if you are, and if that's what you're already doing, you're not sweating right now. And that's what I'm seeing from the people that are succeeding. You know, the to-go cocktail success, the to-go cocktail success, no surprise, is coming from all the cocktail bars because they've got a product that people already are addicted to and love that's different, that's impossible or very hard to do at home. If your whole business model is selling bottles of domestic beer and gin and tonics out of a soda gun, you're struggling right now because no one wants to, no one's going to pay for that, as I said earlier. So you got to really sometimes maybe it's a gut check for the industry to say, what is your business model? Even right down to your pro forma. If you always operated under certain assumptions, those assumptions have been changed. Example. How many business operators focus on trying to control costs? And they put tons of energy into cost control as a measure for profitability. I'm not saying you shouldn't, but I'm saying maybe there's value right now in putting, putting that same brain share into thinking about what is the experience per square foot? What is the hospitality per square foot ratio? What is the fun per square foot? These aren't metrics anyone ever talks about, but every bar owner thinks they have this they have an, usually have an, infl honestly, 22 years of consulting, a pretty inflated view of what their product and their offering is. It's what they believe it to be, but that's not the experience ha people have. And the reason why there's that gap between expectation and reality is because operators don't spend time focusing on that gap. If you focus on the difference between what you want your place to be, what you tell people it is, and what it really is, you identify opportunities to improve things so that you can charge more for your products so that people line up to get a reservation and you're booked months out in advance so that you can provide experience-based menu items like the big night out or the Italian date night and sell someone 80 or $100 worth of beverage where previously you were lucky to get them to spend $13 a head. It's a, it's a, it's a shift in paradigm. It's a shift in approach to business that if your thinking is, I don't have time for that, you're probably going to be end up chasing nickels and dimes in a corner because of all these restrictions on occupancy. Definitely totally agree with that whole idea of 
the model of cramming people into a space is broken. Owners should hone in on guest experiences, the amount of uh, fun port per square foot, as you mentioned, Tobin, uh, that is what is going to create long lasting revenue. And owners won't need to rely on bodies in their establishment as heavily as guest satisfaction. So really well put, Tobin. This might be one way you can even say that COVID is benefiting the industry, sort of forcing owners to dissect their previous business models. Absolutely. Uh, fascinating points by all there. Thank you very much. I want to transition one final time. We've spent a lot of time talking about consumer safety on the consumer side of the bar. However, a big concern is not only for the consumer, but the uh, health and safety of the folks working behind the bar. Yes, Adam, this is really a twofold issue. Number one being bars and restaurants have definitely taken a hit in terms of allowing consumers back in. When in reality, bars and restaurants were already taking a lot of those precautions health-wise. The industry has been having to meet health codes prior to COVID-19. So it'll be interesting to see how establishments tackle new codes. But second, my time be, uh, spent behind the bar has really enlightened me that most bars are not functionally set up for bartenders to, meal, to yield maximum efficiency. So we end up seeing multiple bartenders in small spaces, and these bartenders don't even have workstations of their own most of the time. So owners will definitely have to start rethinking the ways their employees work behind the bar. You know... Again, there's no guidelines given to us yet of what we can and can't do, but we've already been proactive when this first rolled out on not just the sanitation process on cleaning, but the six feet and, you know, the gloves and the mask and the way we sanitize now and the way we, you know, really make sure that any area that's high touch, we're so much more um, aware and you know, going behind the bars, we've already started to look at some process we could have because some of the bars are very limited. And the unfortunate thing is, is we don't even know going forward if they're going to open the bars, if they are, how many people we can have at the bar. So we've looked at drinks we're having and how we can simplify them and still have great phenomenal drinks and great quality drinks. So I think a lot of it's going to determine on when they open the bars, of how many people can be seated at the bars and it, what kind of guidelines they're gonna have for us. We already have our guidelines that we've come up with, but we're also looking for a little bit of, is the government gonna change some of the things we do now? And if so, we wanna make sure again, we're ahead of that curve. If there's gonna be one positive that comes out of this from that angle, from the equipment industry and the design industry, it's understanding and recognizing that sharing has always been bad. And now there's a reason that everyone, the public is paying attention to and the, the you know, legislation and the health agencies are gonna monitor um, having bartenders sharing tools, sinks, stations, all that stuff is always, you know, you know, I, I've been preaching this on my soapbox for, for 15 years. You know, you don't share a keyboard when you go to work. You don't share a desk or a chair with your coworkers. Why are we making bartenders share equipment? It's insane. It mm -hmm. slows down profitability. It increases labor costs. It's bad for guest service. Sure, when you first think about it, you go throwing bodies at a problem at service is the answer. Well, bodies at the problem isn't the answer smarter setups is, are the answer. So each bartender should have their own complete station by themselves. And if you use smart things like put your fruit and your mise en place in a refrigerated drawer instead of out where people can cough, breathe, and sneeze on it, you just reduce risk. Take, sure. your, tools, take your tools from the, the bar top in a, in a mason jar and put them below the bar, protected by the die wall, down low in a recirculating tool caddy, boom. You just reduce risks. You're constantly cleaning and disinfecting. You, you have the ability to clean and disinfect faster and easier. There's so many things that you can do by just designing. Not, not, it's not about COVID-19. It's about what we always should have been doing. But now COVID-19 is the lens that you can put on to realize these tested ideas make sense now and they'll make sense tomorrow. So whether or not we're in the middle of a pandemic, this is the better way to do business. Also, sure. also, labor cost and having too many bartenders behind the bar. You don't need seven bartenders in four wells if you've got the right wells. In fact, 
what I recommend all the time and what I see is if you put in, for example, specifically, if you take my signature series cocktail station by Perlick and you put that in instead of the standard, slightly less expensive ones, your throughput goes up so much, you don't need to have as many stations or as many bartenders. So that's the answer to that problem right there. We put it in front of you five years ago. It's just sitting there waiting for you to, to go ahead and call up Apex or whoever you're, whoever you deal with and have them spec it and install it. All right, Kelly and Tobin, thank you both so much for your insight on these current topics. We really appreciate your work and your love for the industry and thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Tori. Thank you, Adam. You guys have a great day. Live long and prosper. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in to this bar edition of Curate TV. I love being able to shed some light on the bar industry and share the perspectives of some industry leaders. So as always, Adam, it's been fun. Tori, thank you so much. Kelly and Tobin, thank you from me as well. For those of you watching, thank you for tuning in. If you want to click below, we will link some of the resources that we discussed today. Hope you all found this episode beneficial. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll catch you next time.